Huh? <laughs> I may take this off. I move around too much. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Testing, one, two, three. You got it? All right, folks, you guys ready for the nice message? This message is called, I'll repeat it a couple times, Foundation for Little Feet. You guys got that? You understand the little prop here we're going to talk about? Foundation for Little Feet. This is for our children that we're raising up in the church, in our homes, grandparents, aunts, uncles, dads, moms, the foundation for our children. Amen? Amen. Yeah, last, uh, not Friday night, the Friday night before I was down here in the back praying, and anyway, there was a couple shoes sitting in the back on the floor, and I was just laying there praying, looking at them, and I just... And the Lord was really putting it on my heart to think about these kids' shoes. And anyway, I saw a pair of shoes with like an older adult shoe with a small kid's shoe on top of it. And so many times, little kids follow their parents and their steps, don't they? With their actions, their talks, their morals, their honor, their integrity, their structure, they follow dad and mom, don't they? They watch them, don't they? Me, myself, growing up, uh, I had a little bit of Jesus, not really much of it. Inside of our house, we had Christ there, but it wasn't the life-changing Christ we have now. You know what I mean? So my kids had the structure, but they really didn't have the godly values that were seen consistently. You know what I mean? It wasn't there. The foundation wasn't Christ. It was a lot of other things. You know, but if you look at these shoes, when a kid's first born, all of us are like, Man, oh, my kid's going to be a football star, or he's going to be a great wrestler, or a great basketball player, or He's going to do this and that. He's going to be a great singer. All these things, right? An astronaut, an attorney, a judge, whatever. We see all these things for our kids, right? And they're going to be famous. They're going to be a star. They're going to be, their name's going to be that, right? We see these things in our children. But so many times I think we mess the main foundation for our kids. We mess it. And I turn my phone over. See it going off here. But we had actually... Would you make sure it's off down at the little church? I got motion down there. I don't want it going off on her down there. But uh, so many times we mess it. Yeah, when the boys were born, uh, and when they were small, I bought Cody some little baseball cleats. They were little bitty things about that big to play baseball. He wasn't playing baseball, but I bought him some. You know, I bought Dalton little football cleats. All these little like uniforms I was buying for them. I was all focused on their athletic lives. You know what I mean? I wanted to be an athlete and good at this and that. And a lot of times we get caught up on that stuff. And I think and these little kids are so important. And we get a chance to raise these kids up in Christ. We get a chance to. It's a blessing. We have a gift to raise our children up and grandchildren up. We do. Nieces and nephews. We have a chance to inspire them with the word of God. We've got a chance to do that. Don't waste it, okay? Turn your Bibles to Proverbs 22.6. Proverbs 22.6. Proverbs 22.6. You guys ready? It says to train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And train up a child in the way he should go. That's she as well. Your daughter, your son, train them up in the way they should go. Uh, The foundations of the world are built on what? Success, the victories, all the things that you want being noticed. But in our lives, we're going to struggle. Whether it's football, baseball, wrestling, school, girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever's going on, your job, we're going to have struggles and trials. And if we don't have Christ as the foundation for our kids growing up, if they don't understand that's their hope, that's their go-to when they're going through something, they're going to be lost. They'll get into what? Drugs, alcohol, bad friends, bad behaviors, right? They're looking for something. They need a firm foundation. And so many times we tell our kids, man, you're going to be amazing. 
I even brought this here. The size of that shoe there. How many kids want their kids to be a basketball player or football? 0.3% makes it to the NBA. People spend hours and hours and hours with their kids doing what? Sports, athletics, I did it. Wrestling, six days a week. Football, five days a week at the gym on weekends. The healthy eating, the cutting weight, baseball. We did all that stuff. I did that stuff as a kid. I did all those things, but I was never ever fulfilled by those things. They didn't fulfill me. They were fun to do, and there's nothing wrong with them. But don't let that be the foundation at your house. How much time do you put into that stuff? Right? Are you teaching them about God more or that more, right? Turn your Bibles to uh, Psalm 127. Psalm 127. But thinking about this, think about the rock stars. What happens to all the rock stars? They get famous, then what happens? The money, then what happens? Drugs and alcohol, why? Because they're not fulfilled. The biggest stars there's ever been, every single one of them have what? Have a problem with something, some type of addiction. They can't fill this gaping hole. They've got hundreds of thousands of people come listen to them saying... They've got stardom, they're known by everybody, but there's a giant gaping hole inside of them that's never fulfilled. They try and put drugs, alcohol, whoever else, money, people, they try and do all these things to fulfill themselves. But if people would bring their kids up in Christ as a solid foundation from a young age, and yes, even though, man, if they get into something down the road, a sport, whatever else, and Christ is there, They will have a firm foundation the day they get cut from the practice squad or the team or something doesn't work out. They're not going to go kill themselves. They've got Christ as their foundation. That's the hope. That's the hope that they have. It's not something else. You know, my job for so many years, I wanted to be a a cop since I was five years old. And I finally got there. That was my dream. But it didn't fulfill me. I thought it would. I wasn't fulfilled. Why? Because I needed the perfect love to cast out fear. Amen? That's the thing we have to think about. Let's look at Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Let's look at verse number one. And I turned my Bible there a second ago. Hang on. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to set up late, and to eat the bread of sorrows. First so he gives his beloved sleep. Here's the verse. Listen to this, church. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Think about that for a second. And children are a heritage from the Lord. If you're blessed with a kid and God's blessed you with raising a child or helping raise a child, that's a gift. You've been given a great gift. You get to raise them up in the Lord and shoot them out in the direction they're going to go. Right? Their morals and their standards, everything they're going to learn from you. How you act when you're driving down the road or how you act with a neighbor or how you act with your spouse or your girlfriend or boyfriend. How you behave in front of them. They're taking notes. You can't fool them on Sunday or Saturday at church. They're watching everything you do and they're taking notes. And down the road, they'll do the same thing. I remember Danny's grandma. When I first met her, it was really hard to be around her because she was so just staunch in everything she was about, right? I learned to respect this lady. She never changed. She was always the same about having the table set. I don't care if you're having McDonald's. She had to have the plates out and the silverware. And, you know, she always did everything the same. But I knew what to expect from her. It never changed. It wasn't like people who change all the time, depending on what's going on. As I got older, I respected her values. When I first met her, it was like over the top. But she had values that always stayed the same. And we have to raise our kid with a set of values in God, right? Right? Our moral standards, the way we behave, the way we act, the way we talk. I'm not saying they're going to be perfect. Their kids are going to make some mistakes. They will. You have to show forgiveness with your kids. You have to show understanding with your kids. All these things you have to do. And yes, I raised my kids up with major structure. 
They were over the top with a drill sergeant. I was raised the same way. And so I brought that to the table. And yes, I was over the top with it. I know I was. They didn't get away with anything at my house. But they wasn't raised in the foundation of Jesus. And not until I was 40 years old and my son got saved right after me because he saw a change in me. And if I could have done that 20 years prior, wouldn't that have been nice? That would have been. I wasted 20 years being more focused on things of the world, the sports stuff. When the kids were little, I had them doing push-ups and stretching out. When they were born, every kid, I would take them and stretch their knees, their shoulders. Every night before they'd go to bed, they were one year old. I'm stretching shoulders, knees, legs. I'm getting them ready for what? Wrestling, football, baseball. I'm prepping them. Instead of saying, hey, let's sit down, listen to worship music, let's pray, man, let's go over the Bible. Let's... None of that stuff was being done. But I was so focused on their, their athletic careers down the road. And I came from that myself. My dad was into baseball and football, and that's what I was brought up in. You know, and I enjoyed it. I'm not saying they're bad things, but they're not the foundation. They're not your foundation. Foundation is Christ because down the road when they leave your house, when they're 20, 23, 24, and they go out and get a job and they get fired or something happens and they get let go, what are they going to do? What are they going to do the first time they lose in life? What happens? What are they going to do? They're going to trust in God or themselves, right? They have to learn to also take the losses as well as the wins, right? Some people have a hard time. They like all the victories, but they don't like the losses, We have to have humility when we lose in life, do we not? Because losing is humbling. You get humbled when you lose. It's very humbling. And yes, it's painful, but sometimes you have to go through the pain. A lot of times we don't allow people to go through that pain and to increase their faith and to strengthen them. And we want to go in and all this. Sometimes they have to experience a little bit of consequences. There's nothing wrong with consequences with kids. Nothing at all. Anyway, Psalm 127, verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, and so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has a quiver full of them. You know, and now looking back, I've got three sons that are grown up. None of my sons have ever really, they've never been to jail. Glory to God. Thank goodness. Thank God. Uh, All my boys work hard. Work ethic was instilled in them at the house every day. (laughs) They were put to work when I got home daily. I had a list for them just like I had. But the godly values weren't instilled there. That was what was messing. If that would have been there, man, you imagine? And now it's there in Cody's life. It's there. But it took 40 years for it to get there for me. But if you can do it right now as a parent, as a grandparent, as an aunt or an uncle, cousin, whatever else, if there's younger kids... Bring them up in the foundation of Christ. It's solid. You can stand on it. You can be on that solid foundation the rest of your life when things go bad. Because they're going to. Things are going to go bad for you. It's going to happen. They're going to be good and they're going to be bad. Uh, Turn your Bibles to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29. And all of us looking around this room, I think every one of us has some kids around us in our lives we're helping raise, are we not? Even in the church, there's kids here, is there not? If you saw something going on with a kid at the church that was going to hurt them, would you go up and tell them, hey, don't do that? Why? Because you love them, right? It's called love. So we're going to look at this verse right here. Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and, the rod and rebuke give wisdom... But a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Right? Rod means spanking for correction, and reproof means correction, reasoning. All humans need boundaries, or they'll create their own set of boundaries, right? If you don't have any boundaries, you'll create your own. If your husband or your wife says, hey, man, I don't want you doing this, that hurts me. That hurts my heart, or this or that. If I don't set some boundaries... There has to be conditions, right? We have covenants. With our kids, it's the same thing. You have to have boundaries for your kids. If the kids can go drive the car at seven years old down the road, you don't say nothing, what's going to happen? You're going to be in big trouble. (laughs) And that kid's going to be in big trouble as well, or worse. But there has to be boundaries and there has to be a standard. But something I've seen throughout 
I know the last 20, 30 years is a lot of people allow their kids to tell lies. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's just a small little white lie. A lie is a lie. Don't teach your kids that it's okay to lie or let them get away with it. If they try and gaslight you or I'm not going to talk to you, I'm going to shame you now, I'm going to get mad. No. Call them out when they lie. Because they're going to lie when? At school, at the job, down the road. It's going to, and the relationships are going to be horrendous from lying and they learn it at a young age. Call them out when they're young. There's nothing wrong with calling out anybody who's telling a lie. Right? Amen? But I've seen it so many times. Well, it's not that big of a deal. No, if someone lies to a parent and they're lying to their teacher, they're lying to their friends, they're lying to their grandparents, and they're going to lie when they get into college, they're going to, they've learned to lie and it's okay to get away with it. There's got to be consequences. Amen? And yes, when they come clean, love on them when they do. Let them know it's okay that you're a safe place to tell the truth to. Amen? You've got to be that person they can trust that you're safe for them. Amen? But I think we've done that in the last 20, 30 years we, and allow our kids to get away with stuff. And it's like, no, nope, you got to call them out. Anyway, we live in a sin-filled world. It's uh, murder, hatred, selfishness, disrespect, unloving, unforgiving, I mean, gossips, haters of God. It's, uh, and we see it every day, right? Outside these doors with family members that we love so much, and, there, and there's hatred. You see there's a hatred that's grown up, and it's bitterness. There's what? There's unforgiveness going on. And I see it in a lot of families. There's lots of families with bitterness and unforgiveness, and people won't talk to each other for years at a time because they think what? I'm justified to hold this against them, what they did to me. And rather than calling and saying, hey, I forgive you, I'm sorry, whatever else, let's work this out, they don't. But they learn that from a young age. Well, dad never forgave mom or mom never forgave dad. And I saw this get thrown in each other's face as children all the way up. And they go do exactly the same thing. Right? You have to show your kids. You have to show your kids the examples of Christ. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. I'm far from it. But the foundation of everything you do in front of those kids is so important. They are taking it all in like a sponge. And they'll remind you down the road if you ever did something bad. And you try and call them out, they'll call you out right back and say, I remember when you did this to the neighbor or at your work, you said that, right? You get called out in a heartbeat, won't you? That's right. <laughs> Amen. But it's a form of manipulation. And yes, it's learned at a young age. Yeah, one thing you'll see a lot of times, people start crying and trying to get out of the lie. It's like, well, you may be crying, that's a consequence of being caught, but you still have to admit to it. Just because you cried doesn't mean that it's been solved, right? And a lot of people, that's manipulation. Oh, I'm going to cry. No, I still want you to admit the fact once you did. Crying doesn't get you out of it. You have to let it come off your lips. I'm sorry, I did this or that to you and it hurts you. Or I did this wrong, man. I went past this boundary, right? And that resolves an issue, it's over. But if that child never learns to do that, down the road, what? They'll never do it. They won't do it. They've learned that. And it works. So sin has to be exposed and repented of. What kind of example do you show your children? Man, do you deceive your spouse in front of them? And do you ever tell the kids something and say, don't tell your dad or your mom? Do you do that? That's called deception. That's a lie. You're in either a united front as a spouse and husband, or husband and wife. You're either united or you're not. But if you come in behind the other spouse, you're actually cutting them out. You're showing your kids that it's okay to deceive dad or mom or whatever else. You can't do that. You got to be united with dad and mom. They have to see that. They got to, right? Because that child will do one, he's going to play, or she's going to play both sides. Well, dad lets me do this, I'll go to him. Or mom lets me, I'll go to mom, right? We're not stupid. Kids are smart. They're not dumb, folks. You will get manipulated. You will. That's why you have to show a united front at all times. And you have to be honest with them. When you mess up, man, tell them you're sorry. I screwed this up. I made a mistake. And move on. But be straight up with them. Amen? 
The very first sin in the Bible was what? The devil. The devil lied to who? Eve. He deceived her, did he not? Deception. The very last sin mentioned in the Bible is what? Lying. The first sin and the last sin is deception. Don't let any deception, form of deception, be in your life because your kids will call you out down the road for it. They will. No form of deception. The foundation has to be in truth. Amen? So kids have to learn the truth about all things. All right, turn your Bibles to Revelation 21. I just shared that with you a second ago, the very last verse. Revelation 21, 6. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirst. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So anyway, when raising up a child, raise them up in truth. Don't lie to your kids. Don't lie to your kids about anything. You don't have to lie to them. You may, and there might be certain things they can't quite understand yet about certain things, which you've got to wait for. But don't lie to your kids. You're not helping your kids when you lie to them, and they're not helping you I mean, if they lie to you. You're not protecting each other by doing that or covering for someone else. I'm going to lie for them. Don't lie for anybody. That's not of God. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. You guys doing all right? Amen. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1 when you get there. Verse number 1. Children, obey your parents for this is right. Do you guys hear that? Children are supposed to obey their parents. They do. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, and that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Right? We're supposed to honor our parents. Is that hard to do sometimes? As we get older, I think, and our parents are older, and there might be things that come up in conversations, and, and you just don't bite on. You know, it could be politics, it could be something else. My dad likes to talk about politics, and a lot of times I don't even bite. He'll say something I don't agree with, I just, you know what I mean? I'm not going there because it turns into an argument, so I've learned not to say anything. He says it. And he moves on to something else afterwards. <laughs> but you have to learn to honor your parents. I've never said a foul word to my dad and mom. I can say that honestly. I've never cussed at my dad and mom or ever said a foul word to either one of them. Not once. Not one single time. Why? Because I was brought up, if I did, I'd get beat down. I was too afraid to do that. I was too scared. So I never did. It just, it carried with me throughout my life. I always had a respect for them, but not to ever disrespect them. I just wouldn't. You know, and it's and something that we're supposed to do is honor our parents. Uh, verse number four, check this verse out, parents. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord, right? Don't push your kids' buttons to fire them up, because you know you can. Don't sit there and antagonize your kid to where they finally blow a gasket. And do people do that? Yes, they do. Don't push them until they finally push back. You know your kid well enough how much they can take. Yes, and mom's got to be moms and dad's got to be dads. And yes, a lot of dads are a lot firmer than mom. They're not going to nurture like you. They were made different. A lot of dads just call it out the way it is and we'll say it. You know, it depends on the age of the kids or whatever else. But a lot of dads are different than the moms. We are. But you guys can't go in and start slicing. You can't say that to him or you can't. No, that doesn't work. And go behind closed doors and figure it out. Don't do it in front of the kids. Don't do that in front of your children, right? Be on the same front. But anyway, it's so important. Let's look at uh, Proverbs 13. Turn your Bible there. Proverbs 13. Are you older folks? What do you think about fast food now in the drive throughs when you drive up? The uh, service with fast food. From what it was 20 years ago, is it different? How is it different? 
They're rude and they act like they're doing you a favor, right? Would you guys agree? There's no sir, ma'am, no thank you, man, have a good day. There's, there's nothing. They're like annoyed. They even throw their money at you sometimes. You're just like, and I always tell her, I was like, how do these people get jobs? I said, we could never do this at a job. You couldn't be so disrespectful when people coming through the doors. You know what I mean? That's the face of the place, and we all know that. We see that now, but these kids have been brought up that way, haven't they? That it's okay to speak to dad and mom like that. They can do it to people outside. It's okay. No one cares, but they're not getting called out on it. Unacceptable. Behaviors start in the house. We can't expect our our kids to be raised by their teachers. Well, it's the teacher's fault. No, it starts in your house. Raising starts with you. Dad and mom, whoever's raising those kids, that's your responsibility to set boundaries, to love them like the Lord, and to bring in the Lord's standards and lift up the Lord in that home. That's your job. It's not the school's job. That's your job to do that. If you don't like the school, homeschool them. That's all you got to do, right? So raise your kids up in the admonition of who? Of Christ. Amen? Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Did you guys hear that? He who spares his rod hates his son. If there's no correction for your son or daughter, you think they don't need it in their entire life, that they're perfect little angels, well, you got something coming. Sooner or later, man, they're going to run to CDC and be held in a cell for a while, for several years, and you'll be wondering why. How did this happen? They didn't get corrected as a child. And they grew up doing whatever they wanted to do and no one ever stopped them. Not in all cases, but a majority of cases. I went to a lot of homes. And most of the times there's one kid right now who's awaiting trial. I arrested him for robbery at 12 years old. He beat a man to death and went to CYA and just got out and shot and killed somebody else here last year. And right now he's awaiting a murder charge. And every time I went to his house, his mama... He's done nothing wrong. It's you cops. Every single time. It was never his fault. I'm not going to share his name, but it was never his fault. He lived right over here. Never his fault. And now he's awaiting to go to prison. He shot somebody, and I'm pretty sure he's going down on this one. And he just got out for killing an old man, for beating an old man to death, 80 years old in an alley over here. But he was brought up that way at 12 years old. His mom, his dad wasn't around. Mama was, he could do whatever he wanted to do. There was nothing wrong with her son. He was okay. Look at him now. I mean, he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. But it started when he was 12 years old. I remember going to their house. She would never acknowledge he was in the wrong, ever. But his grandpa did. One time I took him to his grandpa, and grandpa whooped him in front of me with a belt, and it was spectacular. It's amazing. Old grandpa out there pulled his belt off, had him in a circle doing a merry-go-round with him. It was awesome. He didn't want to go to his grandpa's house because he knew grandpa would get him. But mama wouldn't touch him. You read the verses, it says it's a shame to mama if she don't correct them kids and lets them grow up. You're not helping a kid by enabling a child. You're not helping them. You're not loving them. That's not love. If you let them get away with something without calling it out, you're not helping them. A lot of times we think we are. We're not. Things have to be called out. Anyway, here we go. So he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him and disciplines him promptly. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. And yes, I've corrected my grandkids a few times, not a whole bunch. Maybe a couple times or something here or there, but not too often. But... uh, even at a young age, they'll challenge you, like, and they'll look at you and go do it anyway and just stare at you and see what you're going to do. And you're like, okay. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Because if they're doing that to me and I let them get away with it, man, the next adult, when they get older, 13 or 14, and they're beating up mom or, or taking the car and running away and going out the window, where did it start? Right here. This is where it started. They learned a routine here that they got away with. Do you know what? I get to do what I want. I'm not saying all kids are bad, but they have to have instruction. There has to be boundaries. Yes, there has to be love. That is love, though. That is love. I got lots of whippings, and I survived. I got too many, I thought, but you know what I mean? I survived. I made it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, love takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices in what? The truth. 
Love takes no... All right, this one here is the Berean I got that one from. Love takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices in what? The truth. That's what it rejoices in. And you have worldly moral standards versus God's moral standards, right? So if you raise your son or daughter up in worldly standards and tell them, you know what? That's okay what they're doing. You can't tell them that. You got to tell your son or daughter the truth about everything. What the Bible says on marriage, on divorce, on relationships, on sex, on discipline, on forgiveness, on unforgiveness, on repentance. All those things need to be shared with your child. Why? Because it's the rest of their life. They're going to have something, their foundation to go on, right? That's foundation. If you don't have foundation, your life's going to be a disaster. You got to have foundation. Even if you're older and you have older kids, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I love you, man. I want to share a verse with you all in love, man. I believe right now the Lord can change the situation you're in. But then you got to examine yourself and look in the mirror and say, hey, I need some change here. Or these things will continue to happen over and over, right? If we do the same thing over and over, but nothing changes, right? <laughs> it doesn't work, does it? Let's do it God's way. Let's do it God's way and not our way, okay? Let's do it God's way. Let's look at uh, Colossians chapter 2. Turn your Bibles there. Colossians 2. Let's look up once you're there. Colossians, I'm going to take that big shoe down. There's my baby shoe right there. My child. <laughs> Size 16. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. Of course, the Laodicean church was one the lukewarm church. And for as many as have seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Here we go. Verse number six. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in what? Faith. Your faith is established in Christ. It's not in yourself. It's not in your job. It's not in your dad or mom. Your faith is in Christ and Christ alone. He's the one that's going to hold you up. Yes, they can be there to help you when need be, but Christ is the one that holds you up. And I'm sure there's people around this room that's been sick. Christ is the one that kept you going, right? Christ is the one that sustains you, right? It wasn't people. It was Christ. Yeah, God sends people to help, but Christ is the one that sustains us. It's only Christ. It's him. Established in faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And here's the verse. I really love to share this verse with folks in the world who are very worldly. I love this verse to shut them down. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Did you guys hear that? You'll see other Christians who try and philosophize with you. I've got no problem with that. That's okay with me or at my house, blah, blah, blah. Say, wait a second, the Bible doesn't even say that. The Bible's against that. And they'll try and philosophize with you. Well, now that was 2,000 years ago. You'll have a lot of people try and go against the Word of God. That's fine. But in your house, you're going to serve God, right? Make sure you serve God. Make sure you serve God and not the world. It's so easy to fall into that trap. Well, it means you don't love me if you don't agree with me. No, it means I love God more than I love you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I'm not going to lie, you, and I'm not going to lie to you to try and please you. Because if I do that, I'm hurting you. I want to share the truth. And the truth is amazing. When you find out the truth, what happens? Your life gets changed. Your life can only get changed when you're shared the truth because you acknowledge who you are to Christ. And you're like, I'm a mess. Lord, I need you, Father God. Thank you. And we have to be able to acknowledge God's word. And it's hard sometimes to read the word of God and go, well, I got to change me. 
I'm not changing him, right? I have to change me. And my choices have to change. Turn your Bibles to James 4. James 4. James 4. And this here's a hard hit in verse as well when you're raising your kids. And the neighbor kids get to go do this. All right? And you're going to hear that. And we always said what? If your neighbor jumped off a bridge, would you? Right? We've all heard that, right? <laughs> anyway, James 4.4. 4. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? If you're trying to be friends with the world and the world's ways, you've made yourself an enemy against your Creator. Take your choice you're going to serve. Serve God first. Love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. Then love your neighbors yourself. But God has to be first. And we can't put any idols above God. And I see it done. So anyway, friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God. I say it again. And if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. And do you think the scripture has no meaning? And they say that God is passionate the spirit he has placed within us and should be faithful to him. And he gives grace generously, as the scriptures say. May God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble, right? Verse 7, so humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Have we seen that? At one time that was me when I was going to church before I got filled with the Spirit of God. My loyalty was divided between the world and God. I was doing both sides. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's fine with me. I don't care. Oh, hey, God, what's up on Sunday? Hey, what's, right? I was playing the part. But my kids saw that at the house. They wanted nothing to do with God. I was going home and drinking after church and watching football. <laughs> but at church, I had the suit on. I was up there, you know, here's my tithe for the week. There we go. Yeah. I was playing the part. But my heart was never changed. True change will be an about face from the things you used to do. It's a complete different direction. True change, you will see it, you will know it. And yes, people around you will see it as well, because it's going to be completely opposite than what you were doing. It's a 180 from who you used to be. And it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. That's where you find your peace at is in Christ. You can't find peace in people who are always changing their opinions on everything. You can't get your peace there. You can't get your peace in trying to please people. It's not going to give you peace. I'm just telling you. We all know that the older folks know. Maybe the younger folks as well. Here we go. Verse number nine. Let there be tears for once you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 7. This is a big verse about foundation right here. Very big, ver very big verse about foundation. Matthew chapter 7. You guys doing all right? Some of the parents are like, man, this guy, he must have heard what happened in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I never got a spank in my whole life. Well, you probably needed one. Here we go. That's right. Matthew 7, 24. Matthew 7, 24. Look right there. This is Jesus. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on what? The rock. The rains are going to come for you, folks. The floods are going to come in your marriage, in your job, in your health, with your kids. The floods are going to come. Sooner or later, there's going to be floods in your life. And there it's going to be hard. But if your firm foundation is Christ and you're praying to God and saying, God, I can feel the spirit of the rain. You can see everything. Father God, you see all the angles, what's going on with this. I'm praying for my son or for my daughter, Father God, and they don't want to know you. That's fine. But I know you can see them, Father, and you're going to draw them in with cords of love. You've got them. I know you got them. I'm just going to trust in you, God. I'm going to back out, Father. I'm going to trust in you. They don't want to talk to me. That's fine. But I'm going to trust in you, God, because I love them. And I know you love me. And God, you love them more than you love me. <laughs> That's what's hard to 
believe sometime, but it's true. God loves our kids. He wants our kids to come to him. Does he not? And we love our kids through everything. We still love them. Verse number 26, but whoever, I'm sorry, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand and the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it fell and great was its fall. Your child will face many storms in life where there is hope when they lose their job, they get a bad grade. They break up with a girlfriend, a boyfriend, they get lied to, they lose a home, they go to jail. Man, life is all about choices, expectations, and what you put your hope in, right? I remember a guy one time, I got a call to a house in the country club. And his parents were prominent doctors here in town, his dad and his mom. I think some of you have heard the story. And he was going to a local high school, a private school. He was a straight-A student, and he had plans on going to some... I'm not sure what college it was, but he wanted to be a, a, a doctor like his dad and mom. Well, anyway, man, he got a B on a test. He got a B. His first B he ever got, and his dad and mom had just left to take brother back to some internship somewhere but through LAX. And so I get a call, and I show up to the house, and he shot himself twice in the head with a crossbow, trying to kill himself. And he's laying, there were two arrows in his skull, and he's trying to take pills when I get there. And he was laying there talking. It was kind of freaky, but I was like, what are you doing this for? He was like, i got to be on my test. I won't get accepted into medical school. And his whole life was about being a doctor. His entire life was focused on being a doctor. You know, the doctor said it was a miracle. It didn't kill him. It, you know, we're, and part of his brain was gone in two sections. It was hunting arrows were through his skull. Two big hunting arrows. They're big. But he survived. He survived and lived. Went back to school. Had a limp on one side of his body or his leg, but the thing is, it's like so many of us put so much into something and something comes along and what? We're devastated, huh? We're devastated because we have no hope. What if this happens? What if it does? What am I going to do if it happens? I'm going to trust in God. He's going to sustain me. I'm going to have to because there's nothing else that will sustain me but God, right? You got to do that. Yeah, there's tragedies. We're going to have them. I'm not saying... And I'm not up here preaching doom and gloom. I'm just telling you, in this life, you're going to suffer. And there's going to be some hard things that come along. You have to have your foundation built on Christ from a young age. And if you're older, fine. Grab onto the word of God and believe it. That's all that will sustain you. All right. Here we go. What about young kids and teenagers? Looks, clothes, possessions, popularity, 13, 14, 15, 16, right? Right? All of a sudden, things change. They hit puberty, and what happens? Their mouth gets crazy. All of a sudden, they've got an armpit hair, and they're the toughest person in the world. They've got all the wisdom there is. They're the smart, right? All these things begin to take place, and you see them at your house, and you go, man, where's that little sweet little person? That, where are they at? It's like something, a switch flips. All the hormones are going on, and all these things are taking place, right? We know it. I raised three boys. We were just talking the other day about Scarlett. And I said, she's so sweet. She's almost 11. I go, man, I just... she hugs me right now and comes up like 50 times when I see her. Well, she still do that when she's 14. I pray that she does, that she has the foundation of the Lord, that the things of the world doesn't draw her away. You know what I mean? Our little girlfriend, we're going to do this at so-and-so's house. So let's get on our phones, right? All those distractions, right? All those things, huh? Just trying to pull them up away from the Lord. All those things. We have to be careful with that stuff, right? we got to be careful. Because I was innocent when I met my wife. And then... <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, it's a whole other story, but yeah. That's partly true. Maybe not. <laughs> but anyway prayer must be taught Bible values, morals and standards God's word is proven and true and parents must display these values as well, right? we have to display these values in front of our kids most children follow their parents' steps behaviors, problem solving, expectations respect of parents, spouse and friends right? 
Your kids ought to respect other parents as well. They should have a respect for them. Amen? I just spoke to Melanie's mom the other day, and I called her ma'am, and Mr. Leon, sorry. You know, I just, it's something that you grow up with. It's something that you grow up with to have a respect for someone else. They're older adults. You treat them with respect. Sir, ma'am, even the kid that came to buy a dog, I called him sir. You treat people with respect, and you'll get it back. But if you want overbearing and you're hard-headed and you want to argue with everybody, and you're going to get the same thing back you give. That's what you're going to get back. Turn your Bibles to Mark 8. Mark chapter 8. We're almost done. We've only got 25 more verses. I'm just kidding. We've only got maybe, maybe four or five. <laughs> And if I could just go back and change the foundation for all the boys when they were young. You know what I mean? They all got baptized at a young age, but they didn't see me and mom walking it out. I mean, they had no reason to, right? You know, that was our fault. That was our fault. I'm not saying a kid can't be raised right and they turn and go to something else. It's possible. But a majority of the time, it's something in the house that they got to see time and time again. And they grabbed onto the same thing that was going on there and tuck it with them. And you wonder why, what are all these things happening to our kids? Well, they were raised like that. They're doing the same thing you taught them. They learned it from you, the best. <laughs> and you learned it from who? Your parents, they learned it from who? They just, but it has to be stopped sooner or later. The foundation has to be Christ. Mark 8, 34. When he had called the people to himself and with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Verse 35. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Right? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in his glory of his Father with the holy angels. So true. In front of our kids' eyes, we build things up, huh? Look at this. You ought to do this, son. Look at the money you could make and all, right? We're like salesmen to our kids sometimes when we're trying to pitch in front of them. Like we're trying to pitch something for them to believe what's best for them. But if they have Christ as best for them, their foundation is Christ. Yeah, they could have any job. They could have anything they want to do as long as it's something that's godly, right? And they're not going to work at a strip club or, you know, something, that's, Right? It has to be something with a moral standard to it. But Christ can be in that job where they're at and with them, and their life's going to be amazing there. Foundation, foundation, foundation. Matthew 22. Turn your Bibles there. Matthew 22. Verse 37. And I shared this one earlier. Matthew 22, verse 37 says, But Jesus said to him, Or you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Is that true? And the Bible covers all... Areas of life, love, truth, man, woman, marriage, divorce, death, jobs, work ethic, sin, repentance, money, giving, forgiveness, mercy, heaven, the lake of fire, the wrath of God, hope, purpose, praise, trust, faith, right? All those things are covered in the Bible. Everything is there that you need for your life, for understanding for your life. God made you. He created you for himself. If you have his plan, your life is going to work out okay. You're going to have at least peace in it. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, and it's... Uh, 
Let's start in verse 14. We're going to get to verse 19. That's where I'm headed to. Verse 14 says, Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and idle babblings, meant for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hamanus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already passed and they overthrow the faith of some. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Right? Everybody who names the name of Christ, let them do what? Depart from sin. If you name the name of Christ, that you're a Christian, then you shouldn't be involved in all this sinful stuff. Oh, let's just sin, no big deal. No, it should be something you're like, no, I'm repelled by that. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to. Right? Amen. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 3. Almost done. 1 Corinthians 3. Here we go. I'm going to start in verse 9. 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building according to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The only foundation that could be laid is what? Is Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the only foundation that will stand in your entire life. Whether you live 100 years, 50 years, whatever. Only the foundation of Christ will be sustained. That's it. Last verse. Turn your Bibles to Joshua 24, 15. Seeing it right here. Cody, you want to read that verse for me? Yeah, just a second. Joshua 24, 15. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods that your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Right, he said, and choose this day to whom you will serve. Why? Because Israel was serving all these other gods. Moloch. Asherah, fertility goddess, all kinds of pagan stuff they were serving. They were serving all this paganism in the world. And yes, we still see it today. We still see it today because people grab onto things because they look spicy and nice. And Oh, let's grab onto that. It's not of God. It's nowhere in the Bible. But people say it's holy. It's not holy. It's just man's traditions and stuff. But anyway, serve God. Let your family serve God. God will take care of you. He will. He'll take care of your kids your grandkids and the next generation, if the foundation is of Him. The foundation has to be of God. It has to be. If it's not, it's going to falter, it's going to fall, it's going to shatter, right? Cody, you want to share anything? Yeah, right. So I just want to encourage you guys. I was, th- I was sitting there thinking about what my dad was sharing, and, and I, I'm willing to bet that most of you that are in this room, if you've ever had children before, probably didn't raise them the way that you wanted to raise them. Is that a good thought? Right? A lot of you, right? So some of you are not in my position right now. Some of you don't have kids. Some of you do have kids. Some of you have multitudes of grandkids now. Right, Some of your kids are already grown up and you didn't have a, a good start with them. Right, I have a, a four, a six, an eight, and a ten-year-old. Right, We have one baby that's in heaven because we lost one. Right, But my idea when, when we read like um, uh, Psalm 124 when it talks about how 
you know, that children are, are the arrows in their father's quiver, right? I take that literally. I'm like, I need to fill up my quiver full of arrows, right? I've even had older people ask me, do you guys not have a TV at home or something, right? <laughs> yes, we have a TV, right? But the point is like, hey, the, the command was what? Be fruitful, multiply, right? So some of you have, you're already past raising. Some of you may be in the midst of raising. Some of you may be uncles, aunts, you know, even cousins, right? Maybe you're, you have a little portion of raising. Here's where I want to encourage you, because I was sitting back thinking to myself, like, believe it or not, I didn't have a, a, a great start growing up. My parents weren't serving the Lord like they do now when I was a kid. They did not, right? So I grew up in the house. The person who I believe that really loved Jesus was my mom, right? She was the one trying to get it, pushing me to go to church. She was the one pushing me to pray, pushing me to listen to Christian music, pushing me to go to youth group, pushing me, you know, when I went to Christian school, going to Hume Lake, the Christian camps, right? My dad, on the other hand, was not. My dad was like, nah, I want to stay home and watch football. Nah, I want to do this. Nah, I want to do that. And so there was a pool. There was like this, this battle going on at home where I wanted... I know it's probably better for me to go with my mom, but I don't want to go with my mom. I want to stay with my dad because I don't want to go to church, right? It's boring. There's a bunch of old people there, right? I don't want to go sit in a church pew, right? What I did most of the time was pick fuzz out of the pews or pick holes in the pews, right? And hide stuff in there, right? And so the thing was, is like, I really sincerely had no, no desire to serve Christ, but I knew my mom loved Jesus, but as far as like us, so yeah, yeah, we believe in Jesus too because we go to church and my dad pays money and we're good. That was my understanding. So I want to encourage you, and maybe people that are watching online or even people that are here, maybe you didn't give the start that you wish you could have given. I'm thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to know why? Because I got saved a month before, literally, like a little bit more than a month before Scarlett was ever born. So my 10-year-old, which is my oldest, has never seen the old me. My 10-year-old knows about the old me. My 8-year-old knows about the old me. My 6-year-old knows about it because I don't hide it from him because I share with him exactly who I was. I'm not a perfect parent either, right? There's plenty of times where I have to go and be like, man, maybe I was too hard. My, my kids are, 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 even Brandon, my youngest, they're, they're, they all know about whoopings. I don't play with them. Yes, my wife is extremely way more nurturing, right? I'm like the principal. It stinks sometimes because... She won't handle her business. So when I get home, all of a sudden, everybody's like, oh, man, they're going to hide. Like, no, no, right? Because when I say something, it means something because I act on what I say, and she necessarily doesn't. So she's like, you want me to tell your dad? And it's just like, no, handle your business, right? But that's a whole other story. But the point is this, is that I'm not, I'm not perfect. I could tell you this, that my desire in my household, it's like this. God's given me talents. You guys know the message of the talents, Jesus shares, and I understand it's not specifically talking about children. It really doesn't specify exactly what it's talking about, but what we know is that whatever we were given, we want to multiply what we've been given, right? And, I, and what I believe that the message of the talents to be is obviously God's given us the Holy Spirit, and, we, and I want to see, God wants to see what's given to us duplicated in others, right? To make disciples and to watch them grow up and then watch them, you know, disciple and make other disciples and make more disciples and make more disciples. It's like, well, what has God given me? What has God given you? Who has given you the greatest down payment in the world, the greatest inheritance that you could ever possibly have is the seal of the Holy Spirit. And he wants you to go tell the whole world about it so that they can have what you have, right? So that you cannot go hide away in a napkin in the dirt, right? Or go, you know, be a basket-headed closet Christian, right, that doesn't ever share with anybody, right, because you're ashamed, right? My dad just read in, in, in uh, Mark chapter 8, I believe it was verse 38, it says, if you're ashamed of me and my word, right, I'll be ashamed of you, right? Especially, you're going to be ashamed of me and my word in this adulterous, sinful generation, right? So I know that, so taking a step back on that, because I'm digressing here, when I look at my talents, I, I also view, as I was sitting back there, I view my children as my talents. It's like, I want to, I want to see in them what God has given me, and even more. My children don't play sports. They don't. Um, my life was all about sports growing up. Sports are not bad. I'm not pulling, removing my kids, but I have to make a choice. In this life, which is short, and the Lord is coming quickly, I have a choice. I could take it, and I'm telling you straight up. The reason my kids, and some of you have asked questions before, and some of you said, "Why, man, why don't you let you? Listen, I got four kids. Put them all into sports somewhere. Wrestling, football, baseball, hockey, soccer, whatever. Every practice and game is going to be on a Wednesday, Saturday. That means I go bye-bye church. 
that means my priorities shift because I'm going to make sure I'm at every practice, I'm out at every game, I'm doing whatever. You won't see me here anymore. The fellowship will be very little, and then my focus will turn. So I have a choice as a dad. Yes, I want them to experience what it's like, you know, to, to you know, make a field goal or, or to, you know, uh, the crowds, and uh, those are great, but the greatest thing I have to offer them is the true, zealous, fired-up relationship with Jesus Christ. You know what I enjoy getting to do? Now I'm getting to take my children with me out into the streets and to see them minister to other people. And yes, my children are extremely loving, more loving than I could. I wish I could be as loving as they are. And maybe I'm jaded because I'm getting older and I understand people and I don't trust people, right? They trust anybody and everybody. They're just like, man, they love them. They sincerely, you see the love of Christ in them. And I'm like, man, this is beautiful, right? But I'm telling you that I'm not a perfect parent. But in our household, our desire is to serve Jesus Christ first and foremost. And that is my first church. I'm going to tell you, if my wife and my children are not grounded, if they're not settled in, I'm not coming here to play church. The Bible tells us, it speaks very clearly about that. That if your house is not in order, don't come, to, don't come anywhere else. And especially as a pastor, how can I handle this household if I can't even handle my own household? That don't make no sense. If I'm not handling my business in my house, how can I come here and handle any business here? Right? And I'm going to tell you, growing up as a kid, I, would t I can tell you that the craziest kids I probably went to school were, were PKs, pastor's kids, right? Preacher's kids, right? Christians, right? They were the craziest, especially the girls, right? And I don't know if they were sheltered their whole life and they just wanted to get out and just do stuff, right? And it was like, man, easy. And, but that's what, I, that's what I grew up living in. But you know what most of them would come out and say? And I've even heard it. Sitting outside, I remember Brother Lee I think it was Brother Lee, Sister Lisa, myself. We might have been on the back side or on the front side of Home Depot. I don't know. Maybe Brother Pat might have been there. But there was a lady, and she was homeless. And she was with her boyfriend or husband, whatever she was with. And she was on drugs or doing whatever. And um, I started sharing. But she was hurt in the church, but her dad was a pastor. And he says, yeah. He says, he could say whatever he wants to. He says, but I went home every day with that demon. He can go to church and he can act however he wants to act at the building. He says, but when he goes home, he's the devil himself. So there was no, like, so even though you had, oh man, he's a pastor, he puts on a show, right? He went, she went home and dealt with that and it jaded her to be like, man, push away from Christianity, push away from this. And that's not going to be a good excuse, by the way. She's not going to blame her dad why she goes to the lake of fire. She'll go to the lake of fire because of her unbelief in Jesus Christ. It's a sin not to believe in Jesus, by the way. So my children are very small. I do my very best. I've taught them all how to pray. I've taught them all through the scriptures. We're within a book away of being through the entire New Testament, 27 books twice, right? I'm giving them a firm foundation in the new covenant before we ever hop over to the old covenant so that they understand where they stand now in comparison to things they could never follow in the first place, like the Levitical law, like 613 laws and commandments and things like that, so that they have a firm footing in Jesus Christ. Do they know it all? No. Do I get on them constantly? Yes. Do they jack around when we're praying? Yes. But I have a promise in the scriptures in Isaiah 55, 11, that the word of God never returns void. I'm so in seed. Whether they fall asleep, whether they're drawing, whether whatever it is. And, and the way that I learned as a kid is that if I could... You know, if I could be drawing or coloring or something like that, it's just like, man, I could pay attention a lot more, right? But to get them to try to sit there and I do a point system, I'm just sharing with you. Look, I don't got it all figured out. I have a 10-year-old. Some of you have raised multiple families. I don't have it all figured out. One thing is for certain. I love Jesus Christ. My wife loves Jesus Christ. My kids love Jesus Christ. And if there's anything that I could ask for more than anything, Proverbs 13, 22 talks about that a good father, a good one, leaves behind an inheritance for his children's children. And we shared about this in our Bible study on um, Wednesday in James chapter 5. The greatest inheritance that I could ever offer my children that will never fade away, that will never grow old, that's reserved in heaven for them, is a living passionate, zealous relationship with Jesus Christ, that they are learning how to walk out Christianity. Not to go to a building and have religion, but how to walk out Christianity. Getting them in the fields, you know, sending them out there, sharing Christ with other people. It's so beautiful. Even my wife and I today, Darlene went with me out to the streets. We went out to, um, we went to Jefferson, right? And she was like, we're going to Jefferson? She's never been with me to Jefferson, right? I've almost been shot and stabbed there for sharing Jesus. So she's like, we're going to Jefferson? I was like, yeah, we're going to Jefferson, 
right? It's going to be all right. And we went out there and got to and got to share. And it's so beautiful because my wife, right? So she she will talk. Her and sister Lisa did get to share a couple weeks ago at the get bus stop because we also went to the get bus stop and shared Christ with the homeless that are up in there too, right? But it's one of those things where it's beautiful to bring my bride with me, right? For her to like hear these conversations, to see how the gospel's communicated and everybody's different, how to be able to share and how to pray and all these different things. And yes, my wife. It's my job as a husband to wash my wife in the water of the word, right? To present to myself a glorious church without spot and without wrinkle, right? That's my job as a husband. And I understand, maybe you're like, man, why is he even telling me about that? I'm not in the same position. I get it. All I'm sharing is my dad was very, very on point when he says that the Bible has an answer for everything. How am I supposed to be a dad? I had to come to repentance. I... I mess with my kids all the time and good fun and sometimes, yep, take it overboard because you think it's funny because you irritate them. And they get all mad, right? It's like, oh yeah, you know, what about this? Oh yeah, well, what about this, right? And giving them a hard time. And so sometimes it, it doesn't go good. So you got to repent and say, God, I don't want to, I don't want to cause, you know, cause my ch- children to come to wrath. So the point is, is that I'm still figuring it out. I don't have it all figured out. But what, one thing is for certain is I want my kids to know Jesus. And right now in our home, that's happening. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's happening. And I'm going to continue to pray with my kids, continue to read with my kids, continue to give them that foundation to continue to hopefully be an example. I'm certain there's things I'm like, man, I could have done way better on that. There's times where I've had to sit my whole family down and apologize and say, guys, I probably could have done a lot better on the way I responded or the way that I acted or whatever it is. And it blesses my children's heart and they see that, right? And my kids, like my dad said, are extremely, extremely loving, extremely caring Right. So so it's a beautiful thing. One of the kids, you know, uh, somebody bumps their their toe. You know, the kids all want to go and pray for them, you know, in Jesus name. And if somebody, you know, does something, you know, my parent, my kids are fully aware of already right and wrong. And they still have a lot to learn. But I hope that we can be that that light that does that. But anyways, going back to the very first thing that I shared that I want to hopefully bless you guys with is that when I grew up, I had my mom. Right who had influence. And then I had my dad who also had influence. I followed the influence of my dad more than I followed the influence of my mom. So I didn't get saved till I was 21 years old, right? So that means I wasn't being raised up. And yes, my mom listening to worship music, doing stuff, but I don't recall us ever sitting around any part of our house, reading our Bibles, praying together, nothing, none of that, right? And when my dad started to, I thought he was the weirdest dude alive. I was like, dude, we're not even at church. Put that thing away. Right? I'm trying to hand my dad a beer. I'm not even old enough to drink it. I'm like, come on, dude, what are you doing? Here's what I'm saying. Is that I start, I didn't have the best, I, my parents provided for me. My parents were there for me. My parents took us to three different practices, traveled all over town, took us to different parts of the you know different states allowed us to wrestle spent their time energy effort they were always there in that from that concept but as far as like a christianity it necessarily wasn't we had religion we had church but here's my encouragement going back to again the very first thing i said i didn't have the best start in christ but i will tell you what happened when i began to see change in my parents that influenced me. My parents influenced a negative change as a kid. My parents also influenced a positive change as an adult. What am I saying? It doesn't matter how bad it was in my household. It doesn't matter how unchristian our household was. It doesn't matter. Because I saw the change And my parents, it impacted my life to want to have what they had, which ultimately was Jesus. And as they began to follow Jesus, I began to watch everything that they did. So, maybe you have, you know, maybe you've already read, and I know some of your situations up in here, right? Some of you have teenagers. Some of you are raising another family. You've already both raised your own families, right? Some of you are raising your family. Some of you have, you know, nieces and nephews, you know, that you're partly responsible for, right? You love them. So you share the truth with them. Some of you have little kids all around you. Some of you have grandkids, 
right? Maybe it didn't start off good, but it could finish good. I'm living proof that it didn't start off good, but I pray it finishes good. Because I saw change in those that can influence me. Believe it or not, I mean, my mom, my dad, up until this point, talking about having fellowship, it's so important because there's plenty of times, my dad can tell you, early on in my walk in Jesus Christ, 10 years and 10 months, right? That's, and some change, how long I've been serving Jesus Christ. All glory to him. All glory to what he paid for. You guys saw that last worship song? That was, that was rough, right? I was like, oh man, it was horrible. Sister Sarah, they were showing like the crucifixion. They were showing him to get his back with. I mean, I was like, man, like God, look at all that you did because of me, but for me, right? So it was hard to watch. But the point that I'm making is, is that to see my parents come to follow Jesus, that impacted my life to want to follow Jesus. What I needed was a new heart, and God gave that to me. God gave that to my parents. So you still have influence, right? I'm an uncle now, right? My little brother just had a, had a kid. That's awesome, right? So... I look forward to being an influence in his life and I pray that I will be and I pray that I'm there for him, right? He may not have the best start, but I can be an influence to having that. And the point that I was trying to make a second ago because I got off track is that my dad, plenty of times, he could tell you, he could, he could, he could verify. There's times, my first couple of years of following Christ that I wanted to quit, that I didn't want to follow Jesus anymore. Did you guys know that? There was times when I first started following Jesus because there was so much confusion. People showing up to my door, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons. I'm like going through this like, what? You know, what are you talking about? I had one dude show up to my door tell me that, that God had a wife, right? And I'm like, what? You know, and then he's just like, yeah, yeah, you know, we don't celebrate the holidays. You know, we, we celebrate the Sabbath. I was like, yeah, we, me too. Like, where the heck is this? And he's like, yeah, you know this. And so I just, I would get stumbled. And there would be things. And I'm like, man, where does that? And I was like, I just went to my dad one time. I said, you know what, dad? Skip it. I said, there's just too much going on. There's too much whatever, whatever. And what did my parents do? My parents discipled me and continued to help me walk through these hard times. And so that I was strengthened and strengthened and strengthened and strengthened. That's why it's so important to fellowship. Because we naturally want to just go hide and be hermit crabs. We don't want to be around people. We would rather just say, nah, you know, whether you got hurt at the church, something happened, whatever, you go and hide away somewhere and you don't fellowship with the body. Jesus called a body, not a person. So when you think, I'm just going to go and I'm going to have my own thing and I'm just going to study the Bible at my house by myself, all's going to be well. There's an importance for having fellowship. There's an importance for the body become, coming together, right? So I'm blessed that my parents, for years, right? And yeah, God's made me strong now. There's plenty of things. I face all kinds of stuff. And my dad read it tonight, 2 Timothy 2.15, studying to show yourself approved unto God so that you could rightly divide the word of truth, not being, a, not being ashamed, right? So it's like, yeah. So now it's like, yes, God's helped me and, and allowed me to grow. But he gave that to me through those who can influence me. So you have influence. Whether or not your kids are young or old, you still have influence, somewhat of influence. Be that influence that causes that change when they see Christ in you. That's the greatest, greatest example you can ever give is how God changed you. And it could impact their life to cause them to say, hey, I want some of that too. So anyways, some of you may have kids again or even people online currently have little kids. It's like, hey, Look at all these little talents. Look at all these little gifts that God gave you. The fruit of the womb is a reward, right? That's a reward from heaven, from God, right? Just like a wife. It's favor from God, right? Proverbs chapter 18. It's favor. God's favor upon you. Children, God's gifts to you. Well, raise them up in the right way. Lead them to know Christ. And maybe if you're sitting here thinking like, man, I've done a horrible job. Praise the Lord. Go in the right way now. Be that influence. Be that change. So I thank the Lord for what he's done. I thank God for all of my children. I thank God that now my parents are following Christ. That's beautiful. I could not imagine trying to win my parents over to Christ. I bet you that if the, the Lord would not have saved my parents, I don't know where I'd be at today because they were the ones that caused a change in me. Right? Jesus changed me. Jesus saved me. Jesus forgave me. My parents didn't do any of that. But my parents were influenced for me to come to that place. Do you see? So I thank the Lord for my parents. And yes, now, 
It's the first, first uh, commandment of promise, right? Honor your father and your mother, you shall live long in the earth, right? I don't care to live long. I just want to be with Jesus. Hopefully, you know, eventually he's going to allow it to happen, right? But there's plenty of stuff my mom will ask me to do, and I'm like, dude, dang it, right? I don't want to, but she's my mom. I don't live with her anymore, right? I got armpit hair now, <laughs> right? And chest hair and hair on my ears, right? So you think, oh, man, I'm a man, right? But if my mom my dad asked me to do something, it's like, dang it. Sometimes I'm like, I don't want to do that. But I'm aware I want to honor my parents, whether or not I'm living in their house. And that is well-pleasing to God. So God bless you. All glory be to God. I thank God for the message. I pray that you're encouraged, even if you think you're past your point of influence, you're not. You still have kids. And you could still influence them in the right way to come to Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Praise the Lord.